YouTube channel. Now today, I'll be continuing on with my series of reviewing the Beatles albums with their 10th studio album, which is called The Beatles, but commonly known as The White Album, a double album released in November 1968. Now, being as this is a double album, this will be a two-part review, and in this first part, I'll just be reviewing the first record. So, as usual, I'm going to give a bit of history and background behind the album before I get on to the songs. So, in February 1968, the Beatles, along with their wives and girlfriends of the time, went on a meditation retreat in Rishikesh, India, with spiritual guru Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, as you do. Uh, while at the retreat, they wrote a lot of songs, while John, Paul and George had their acoustic guitars and wrote a lot of songs while they were there. And as a result, when they returned to England after the visit, they had enough songs to make a double album. So, in May 1968, at George Harrison's home in Isha Surrey, the band recorded acoustic demos of all the songs they had written while in India. And at the end of May 1968, sessions for the album began at Abbey Road Studios in London. So, now for the first time at these sessions, John Lennon brought in his new Japanese artist girlfriend Yoko Ono, which did cause some friction for the other band members. Um, you know, it might sound silly now, but before this they hadn't brought girlfriends or wives in. There'd been the four of them with the producer George Martin and a couple of studio engineers. So now that Yoko was at every session, it did cause a rift for Paul and George, especially not so much Ringo. I don't think he cared so much, but that has been well documented over the years. And that's what started to happen. But um, So the White Album is the only double album the Beatles made. And there's a myriad of musical styles on the album. 30 songs, every song sounds different, a very diverse collection of songs. Now interestingly, the working title for the album was A Doll's House, um, that's what the album was going to be called, but a lesser known band called Family released an album called Music in a Doll's House um, in July 1968, so the Beatles didn't end up using that title. Now in the Beatles anthology documentary series from the late from the 1990s, when the White Album was talked about, producer George Martin said he would have preferred it if it was a single album and if the album had been condensed a bit. Now, George Martin, he was entitled to his opinion, but I, I disagree. I think the fact that it's, there's so many styles of music and there's you know so many tracks and on here and it's very diverse, I think that's what makes it unique and different. It is all over the shop, you know, in a way, but um, I'm glad that they made it a double album. So I think the album is fine, and I think it shows them that they're most um, diverse, you know, and experimental, really. So the album cover, the very simple and minimalistic album artwork was, was designed by pop artist Richard Hamilton, and it's a plain white cover with the Beatles uh, embossed on it. But there's Mark, but there. Ooh. Can you see that? And, uh, you know, the cover was designed to be the opposite of the Sgt. Pepper Magical Mystery Tour covers the year before, you know, which were these very psychedelic, colourful and trippy album covers. And a year later they come up with a complete opposite. So from that perspective it is quite a clever cover. And inside the gatefold is the song titles were there. And uh, inside, by the way this isn't an, an original press in. I'd like to pick up an original maybe from eBay one day mono. This is a 2012 remaster, um, and inside here is, is a poster which did come with the original, a big poster. A cool collage of photographs for there. And the lyrics printed on the other side. Pretty small, but uh, that's there, okay. And uh, it's the four photos of the band in here as well, which did come with the original as well. And uh, this is the first album uh, by the Beatles to be issued on their own record label, this was um, Apple. The record label they set up in 68 
the first ever self-made record label actually and uh, they returned to India and jo John and Paul went out to uh, promote Apple in New York and they do a funny interview uh, promoting it and John's just kind of messing about with the interviewer for the 10 minutes and Paul is kind of just laughing on the side kind of stoned you know so that's quite a funny interview and uh, so I have the 2018 uh, remix album by Giles Martin Uh, which is the the remixed album with the Isha demos, which I've mentioned the demos recorded at George's home, an acoustic guitar, and they hadn't officially been released before 2018, so that's pretty cool. And uh, I have the 2009 remastered CD, which I picked up would be 10 years this summer. God, that's gone fast since I picked this up. And this is the one I've been used to all these years playing. And here's the 2018 remix CD there. So I'm going to get on to the songs now. <laughs> I say in a Liverpool accent. Uh, just going to have a bit of liquid courage. Which is actually a cup of coffee. So uh, on record one, so this song, the first song on the album, the album kicks off with uh, the brilliant rock and opening number back in the USSR, which Paul McCartney wrote this song in India as a parody of the Beach Boys' California Girls and Chuck Berry's Back in the USA. And uh, Paul played the song to Mike Love of the Beach Boys, who was staying with the Beatles in India, on his acoustic guitar, he played it. And uh, Mike suggested he puts a spin on things in the Middle Eight, instead of California Girls, sing about, you know, Ukraine Girls really knock me out, and Moscow Girls make me sing and shout, those lines kind of make me laugh, so, in a way. But um, that's for those, so Mike suggested those lines to Paul. So that's where they come from. And on the finished recording, it's, it's very energetic and rocking and it's a very good guitar solo, which is played by Paul on the song. So this takes us along to Dear Prudence. It's a song John Lennon wrote in India about the actress Mia Farrow's sister, Prudence Farrow, who was with the Beatles at the camp in India. And uh, while there, she refused to leave her room. So basically, John wrote this song for her encouraging her to come out and join the fun if you like and it's a very nice song it's a nice acoustic guitar um, and harmonies on the song and an interesting thing to note on the first two songs on this album Paul uh, back in the USSR and Dear Prudence Paul played the drums because Ringo had briefly left the band after an argument and gone away to Sardinia on holiday <coughs> right so he made his return on, on drums on the next song which is Glass Onion an interesting song. It's a song that references several previous Beatles songs, including Strawberry Fields, I'm the Walrus, The Fool on the Hill and Lady Madonna. Uh, a few red herrings in the song. The line in the song, here's another clue for you all, The Walrus was Paul, is a reference to Beatles fans who were looking for Paul is dead um, clues. You know, the Paul is dead rumour, the rumour that Paul died in a car crash, which is silly. But John would put clues and songs and album covers just for fans to look into you know and so that's where that comes from and walrus is a symbol of death in some uh, nordic countries you know but anyway we can move along to obla di obla da uh, uh, paul mccartney wrote this uh, kind of scar-ish song it's supposed to be like a scar parody uh, based on a, say a saying a guy he met a, a friendly became somebody became friends with jimmy scott a nigerian conga player we met in India on the retreat, um, who, who used to say, obla di obla da, life goes on bra. That was one of his sayings. So that's where that, the inspiration for the song came from. And when I got to recording the song at Abbey Road Studios in London, they went through numerous takes of the song, which kind of annoyed John. And uh, and, and the story goes, uh, you know, John got a bit annoyed and, went, and he went off to the toilet and smoked a joint. And when he got back to the, he banged out the piano intro uh, and he said, right, it goes like this. That's just quite a funny story. So that's where that comes from. So we go along to Wild Honey Pie, which is a um, 50 second experimental number composed by Paul. And uh, there's not an awful lot to say about this song, but uh, Paul, he triple tracked his voice on the song. So that means it sounds like three voices instead of just the one, just his own. And um, so there we are. 
and uh, he shouts out Honey Pie for 50 seconds, basically. So we move along to the continuing story of Bungalow Bill, which uh, is a, a John Lennon pen song written about a real-life hunter that John had met on the India trip, who went out tiger hunting with his elephant and gun, instead of accidents he always took his mum. <laughs> That's where that funny line derives from. And uh, maybe my least favourite song on, on side one. I mean, it's kind of catchy, the chorus is, I suppose, but it's kind of a campfire type of song. So, but interestingly, on the last verse, Yoko Ono sings a line for the first time. Now a more serious song. Uh, George Harrison's excellent While My Guitar Jenny Weeps, with his lyrics inspired by the I Ching book, Book of Changes, which George was reading at this time. And um, there's, there's a very nice demo that George recorded on acoustic guitar, which featured on Anthology 3. However, the version on the album is uh, much different and more produced, and Eric Clapton played the guitar solo on it, which is a brilliant solo. And the story goes, you know, they were working on the song at Abbey Road, and John and Paul weren't taking the song really serious, and George thought that's a shame because, you know, he, he knew this is a good song. And he he went home and he was driving into London the next day with Eric, his friend, and um, he asked him if he wanted to come and play on the song. And Eric was like, no, nobody's played on a Beatle record before. And George said, well, so it's my song, and I want him to play on it. So that's how he ended up playing the guitar solo on it. And um, the song is a fine example of George at this point really starting to get out of the shadow of, of Lennon and McCartney, who were like the dominant songwriters um, in the Beatles. And it's fantastic. So this takes us along to the last song on side one, Happiness is a Warm Gun, which uh, could be my favourite song on the first record. Um, it's, it's actually three songs, three sections condensed into one song. So it's kind of an early prog rock song in a way. And... Um, it's a solid band performance by all four members. And my favourite part of the song is towards the end, the doo-wop style ending, where John really goes for it on the vocals, I mean. And um, <clears throat> there's a bit of dispute whether the bang, bang, shoot, shoot back in vocals has something to do with heroin use. John was taking heroin at this time in the late 60s. And the title, Happiness is a Warm Gun, derives from a gun magazine which George Martin had in the studio and he showed John and it said happiness is a warm gun on the cover of the magazine and that's where the the title of the song comes from. So that's side one. So we move along to the opening song on side two which is Martha My Dear which is a song Paul McCartney wrote about his English sheepdog who was called Martha and um, it's an enjoyable ditty. Paul plays all the instruments himself on the song including piano, guitar, bass, drums and hand claps. So following on in a very different vein is John's I'm So Tired, written about a, a bout of insomnia which he went through in India. And I think the, the last verse is very funny. Um, you know, I'm so tired, I'm feeling so upset. Although I'm so tired, I'll have another cigarette. And curse Sir Walter Raleigh, he was such a stupid get. And Walter Raleigh was the guy who introduced tobacco to Britain. So <laughs> that's kind of, I, I really like that last verse there. So we move along to Blackbird, a very nice acoustic ballad, written and composed by Paul, and he still performs the song in concert. Um, written by Paul in India, about inspired by the civil rights movement in America, which was rife in 1968. And the bird in the song is supposed to be a black woman. Um, of course, bird is British slang for woman. And um, yeah, the melody is really nice on the song, it's a really nice tune. I'm sure a lot of you, most of you know the song. Um, so we move along to Piggies, which follows on another animal related song written by George. And the Piggies in the song, so it's supposed to be a political song. Piggies supposed to be a politician. It's kind of a funny little song. And um, it's quirky and it's a quirky song. It's not like, it's not amazing, but the, the Baroque, the kind of the harpsichord and the instrumentate, the strings are kind of different and interesting on the song. This takes us to the last of the trilogy of uh, animal-themed songs on the album, with uh, Paul's mock country and western song, Rocky Raccoon. A story of this Rocky Raccoon character, uh, who's, um, who's girl, uh, called Lil McGill, sometimes known as Nancy, um, treats on him with someone called Dan, runs off with someone called Dan, and they have a showdown, and Rocky ends up getting killed. 
So that's what the song's about. And I like the saloon bar, you know, piano, guitar, honky-tonk piano played by George Martin on the song. It gives an interesting flavour to the song. Um, so this takes us long to Don't Pass Me By, the first song Ringo Starr wrote, and apparently it dated back to about 64. An interviewer asked Ringo if he'd written any songs, and he said he was working on one. It turned out to be Don't Pass Me By a few years later. It's not one of my favourite songs, actually. I'm not saying that because Ringo wrote it. I don't know, it's kind of maybe a bit simple compared to the other songs, but I, I, still, I still enjoy it, you know. And Jack Fallon, this guy called Jack Fallon, plays the fiddle on the song. So we move along to Why Don't We Do It In The Road, which, as you can tell, is, uh, from the title, one of the silliest songs on the album. Yeah, it's, it kind of, it's more of a ditty than a song, really, but it's under two minutes long, but it shows Paul's versatility as a vocalist, I think. I mean, you wouldn't think it's Paul McCartney if you didn't know. It kind of is a raw vocal. He shouts out the vocals. Why don't we do it in the road? That's basically the words of the song. And only Paul and Ringo played on this song. And apparently John was a bit annoyed that he wasn't asked to play on the session. Um, which um, maybe is more his style of song, I suppose. So after this, we have a very different Paul McCartney composition to Why Don't We Do It In The Road, I Will, which is a very nice love song with a very nice melody, and it is very nice indeed. And uh, he wrote it for Linda Eastman, uh, who became Linda McCartney. It's a very short song, it's under two minutes long, but yeah, it's very nice, very tender. So last but not least on side two is uh, John Lennon's ballad for his late mother, Julia, who uh, she sadly died in a in a car crash. Uh, sorry, run over by a policeman when when John was only seventeen years old. And this is a song for her, and it's just John with his acoustic guitar. Um, he sings it. It's the only solo John Lennon recorded in the Beatles catalogue. Uh, it's very nice, very poignant, and um, it's actually the last song recorded during the White Album sessions. And it's also so it's a love song for his mother Julia hence the title, but it's also a bit about Yoko as well. Um, so there we are. And that's uh, Julia, and that's record one of the White Album. That's my review of part one of the Beatles White Album. So, I hope you enjoyed that part one of the review. And I'd just like to say thank you for watching. So as usual, feel free to like, share and subscribe. And uh, I'll see you soon for part two of the review. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.